God's doing through this ministry, he's doing through you and all of us. It's not a one man, one woman show. God's using all of us. You know, the world says it takes all kinds to make the world go round. That's a lie. The only thing keeping the world moving forward is the children of God. Everything else is causing the world to die. Amen. And I'm, I'm just tickled to be here today. You know, this is my favorite place to preach, to teach the Word of God. It really is. I, I, don't, I love preaching in Baton Rouge. It's such a huge platform, but it's not my favorite place to preach. Right here he is. This is my favorite place to minister the Word of God. And, uh, because this is where God has planted me as a pastor. And, uh, and I'm thankful again. You know, I never thought that we would ever plant a church. I mean, I, I, I don't have one book at home about church planning. God just does what God does. I never thought we'd be sending, uh, which is very costly, the planning of a church. It's also very costly to mail six expositor study Bibles every week to inmates across the land. I never thought we'd do that, but God just does what God does. And he's just looking for a people to say, yes, sir, we will. I choose. I choose. Thank you, Brother Dale, for ministering a powerful word last week. Brother Dale is a huge blessing, and I'm thankful for him. And those others who minister the word in this pulpit, this is a place that God has given not only us, but a people all over really the world. People in the Philippines, people in Australia listen to what comes out of this house. They listen to what comes out of this house. And even many more places than that. And I'm not boasting in us, I'm boasting in our God who's given us what we have to offer. It's nothing we came up with. We didn't do this. God's doing this, and I'm thankful for that. This morning, if you'll turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, I will continue down this avenue this morning of the glorious change, part three. The last two Wednesday nights, I've ministered a message called the glorious change, and it's very important that we begin to learn what the church is not known for 2,000 years almost, and that is how to be changed, how to, be cha how to live for God. You ask a typical Christian, how do you live for God? And they'll tell them, they'll tell you, well, you go to church, you read your Bible. No, that's what you do. How do you live for God? How do you literally Live for God when there's something in your life that's trying to hinder you from expressing him properly. When there's sin in your life that you know shouldn't be there, how do you get through that? How do you get rid of that? How do you live for God? Because living for God is experiencing the one who is life, Jesus. You're not living for God unless you're experiencing Christ. And here comes a statement most Christians would stone me for, if you are experiencing him, you're expressing him. If you're not expressing him, you're not experiencing him. You can get mad about that and run all over the world, do what you want, but if you're experiencing Christ, you're expressing him. Because the very experience of life is always results in the expression of life. Amen. Amen. And us being changed, the message of the cross is more than us just finding and knowing now, oh, that we don't have to live in sin. Sin no longer has to dominate me. I can live by grace. I can, I can experience power in what once held me in chains. I can be delivered from. And the reason for that is for the sake of the name of Christ. But here comes the second one, for the sake of others. For the sake of others. The cross wasn't about, it wasn't for Jesus, it was for you. Paul said, listen, I endure all things, all hardships for the sake of others. So the message of the cross is not just for you to learn to live in victory, it is for that. Because without that, you cannot bless others. 
You can't be a blessing unless you've learned how to live in victory. Amen. The very, the very expression of Christ is one of triumph in our lives where people see that we're not who we used to be. People that used to know Brother Dale years ago, they really can't even hardly believe it. But they can't deny it because they see the, the fruit, the change. It can't be denied. He's not who he used to be. He doesn't do what he used to do. He doesn't hang out with those he used to hang out with. His interests are now not what his interests used to be in. There's a change. And guess, it, it affects everybody that knows him. To some, he is the stench of death. To others, he's the, he is the very aroma of life unto life. Because now his expression is Christ. I'm not talking about a perfect people. I'm talking about a perfect God doing a perfect work. And when he's allowed to, it brings about changes. And the changes, yes, they're for you, but, but they're for others. The reason God doesn't just save us and then kill us and take us home is because he wants others to see him through us. Not just us be known for a church we go to, but us be known because we're Christ's disciples. Amen. That's what you're here to be known for, Christ's disciples. And the world sees that, Jesus taught, as you have love one for another. Not the way the world loves, where you're just tolerant of everything, but where you speak the truth into every situation. That's true love. Love is not tolerating what's wrong. Love is speaking out against what's wrong. But first, love deals with our own hearts. Amen. This part three of this message, The Glorious Change, is really going to be subtitled, Learning to Trust in the Power of Christ. Learning. You ain't got it, my friend. You're, hopefully you're in the process of of a, of a continual getting it, but you ain't got it. You know what I meant, you ain't got it. This woman told me years ago after coming to Crossway Church, probably maybe six months, if it was that, she walked up to me after church one Sunday and said, okay, brother, I've got the message of the cross. I'm going back to my church, which was proof she didn't get it because when you get it, you don't go back to where it, it does not exist. Well, that just might have hurt some of you's plans. But I'm sorry. You gather with those of like precious faith. Amen. Amen. Are you being changed? You can be. But God's not just going to change you. It takes your faith in the cross. Because the cross is the life changer. Nothing else will change a life. The cross is the life changer. Let's pray this morning before we begin. Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to be in this house. And Lord, I did say this house with this people that you have given us to do the work of your hands, to experience you, to grow together, to learn the truth, to be equipped for the work of the ministry that you call the ministry of reconciliation. And I pray today that you would equip us with that which we need, that you would give us that daily bread that would sustain us, Lord, today, that you would give us wisdom this morning, that during this service this morning, blinders would be removed. The limits that have been there would be cast away. And that we would be able to see more clearly now that which we have claimed to be holding to. And that we would begin to experience the changes that you want to make even at a greater level. And that we would no longer make excuses, but we would humbly surrender to the truth of the cross, a place of death. Death to our will, death to our strength, death to our way, death to everything about us, but life in you. 
And we ask you to move mightily in this service today. We ask you to speak to our hearts that we might hear you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, we see here in verse 4 a very powerful scripture. And we need to always remember that the Apostle Paul never moved away from the cross. He never moved away from the cross. He, he always brought our attention back to Calvary. Habitually, constantly. Paul never let go of the cross in any of his teachings. He couldn't have or it could not be considered scripture. Because Jesus said the scriptures are about him. And what makes the scriptures about him applicable to us is what he did at the cross alone. Alone. The church doesn't know that. But anything else is just legalism and witchcraft and works on our part. And we're going to see some things this morning. I've already asked the Lord, and we just prayed again, to impart this truth in our hearts today in a greater way. Don't go, listen, don't grow comfortable with the message of the cross if you have your faith isn't there any longer. Because the cross is nothing is comfortable about the cross. There's nothing comfortable about the cross. If you think it is, we'll carry you out there and hang you on one. We'll see how comfortable you think it is. There's nothing comfortable about denying yourself and your reasoning and your thoughts and what you have to say in the matter. There's nothing comfortable about that to our flesh. We have to surrender. Okay, God, I'm wrong. And it takes, it takes a man or a woman or a boy or a girl realizing they're weak. You have to realize you're weak. Not say you're weak. You have to realize and accept you're weak. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about really in everything. You're weak. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, For though he was crucified, talking about Christ, through weakness. Do you see that? And remember... Never forget, Jesus is your example. Jesus is always your example. Not your preacher, not your spouse, not your parents. They can be an example if their faith is right. Only if their faith is right. Jesus is our overall example. And the Bible says here he was crucified through weakness. Yet he lives by the power of God. That speaks of the cross. He was crucified through weakness. He didn't have to be. He could have called legions of angels. He could have shown his power, but he didn't. He chose through weakness to go on into the will of his father. Through weakness he was crucified. Tells us right there in the Bible. Through weakness he was crucified. Yet he lives by the power of God. That speaks of the resurrection. You and I, when listen, our born again experience is the greatest picture of what really happened at the cross. Because we became weak and broke and had at least some realization that we were weak and had no strength and could not save ourselves. And it was only through believing what had, in what Jesus had done at Calvary, which is the gospel, that we could be saved. We were broken and weak. And that's how God could shed his grace on us and save us. Because only when you look at the cross... Can you see the clearest picture of God's grace? Remember what God told the apostle Paul? When he cried out, Lord, three times he cried out, begging God, Lord, I need you to take this thorn out of my flesh. 
It's got to go, Lord. It's killing me. This messenger of Satan I've been buffeted with, which the word buffeted means beat. I'm being beaten with. It's got to go. And the Lord spoke to him and said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Do you know what that means? That means what I did in my son at Calvary is all you need. Remember, well, that ain't what's written in the Bible. Well, sure it is. Jesus said, by the grace of God, or Paul wrote about Jesus. He said in Hebrews 2 and 9, Jesus, by the grace of God, tasted death for all men. And then 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, God was in Christ reconciling sinners to himself. God had to be in Christ doing the work because that's what grace is, God in you doing the work. Because of your faith in what God was doing in Christ, that's what allowed God to move in you and begin the work in you. That's called grace. But it was in the weakness of Christ that God... By, the, by his grace, saved us. Amen. It's only through weakness. Hope you see that today. Watch what Paul says, second part of this verse 4, because we also are weak in him. But we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Now, wait a minute, that's confusing because I thought I was strong in him. Well, that ain't what Paul says. And he, here's the confirmation right here, my friends, for those of you who have ears to hear. Here's the confirmation that in him refers to the cross. Romans 6, 3 says, don't you know? Most of the church don't. They didn't then, they still don't. Don't you know that as many of us as have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized, immersed, placed into his death? In him, through your faith, in his death. And I love this kindergarten expression the Lord gave me. When God saw your faith for the first time right, it was in the death of Jesus, in what he was doing on the cross, in dying for you. And when God saw that faith, he said, that's legitimate faith. And God took you and he put you in what your faith was in. It's still the only legitimate faith, object of faith. Because Colossians 2, 6 says, As you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk ye in him. That means keep your faith in him. That means in what he did at Calvary. And that is a place of weakness. Jesus died. He was crucified through weakness. If you're carrying your cross daily, denying yourself, you're going to appear weak, but you're living with him by the power of God toward others. See, it's still about others. The cross was about others. Jesus is carrying the cross literally, physically. He's carried it. He's got the crown of thorns on. He's, he's on the road to the hill. And some lady's crying for him. He stops and looks at her. He's ministering to people carrying his cross. And she's weeping. And Jesus stops to minister to her. Don't weep for me. Weep for yourself. And really... To me, it represents the true place of ministry. You can't minister unless you're carrying the cross. And I'm, your cross is not your daily hardships. Your cross is not your bankruptcy, your divorce, your loss of job, your... Infer you, listen, you better know what your cross is when that stuff comes. Your, they ain't but one cross. Jesus carried it and died on it at Calvary. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. That's one. 
See, the church don't know that either. They think, they think their cross is their hardships. No, that's their hardships. The cross, when we deny ourselves daily, the way we know is a biblical denial is that if we're taking up our cross, if our faith is in Christ and what he did at Calvary, then everything that we're denying ourselves of is for that purpose. If you're denying yourself of snicker bars and baby roofs, well, good for you. It's probably bad for you. I like them. So what? But if you're denying yourself of anything that doesn't result in faith in the sacrifice of Christ, your denial is just all about you. Glory to God. The church doesn't know this. Let's look at this scripture a little more because this is where we're going to find our answers in the scriptures. Amen. Jesus was crucified through weakness. It says here in verse 4 of 2 Corinthians 13. And then Paul says this amazing thing, for we also are weak in him. That means our faith in the cross makes us look pitiful. He looked pitiful. He looked pitiful. He looked weak. Don't you know what that had to be like? He healed everybody that came to him. He fed thousands of people without a grocery store. He brought dead folk out of the grave, been dead four days. He opened blinded eyes. The Bible says he did so much that if there were books written about what he did, the world couldn't contain them. You understand that? So when he goes to the cross and he's hanging there, what do you think that looked like? All that he had done was in vain. And they were hollering at him. You did all this, that, and the other, man. If you're, if that, that must not have been you. Don't you know they thought that? That must have been what the Pharisees really said. It must have been the devil. Your mother must really be the whore they said she is. You weren't born of a virgin. You're not the one who fulfills Scripture as the Messiah. If you were, you'd come down from there and show them the power of God. But see, they didn't know that it had to be through weakness so God's grace, God's strength, God's power could be made perfect for you. Amen. Mm. See, the cross is God's strength being made perfect in weakness. You understand that? The cross is God's strength being made perfect in your weakness. It had to begin with Christ. Some of you looking at me like, uh-oh. I know it's better than your amen -ing. Everything's about the cross. We don't just sing about the blood. We don't just have the blood on the website and the sign. That's what our faith is literally in. That's what our hearts are trusting in, what he did for us, not what my preacher might do for me, not what they're going, what Jesus did for me. For he's the one who ushered grace into us through his death in weakness. There's no other avenue of grace. There's no other avenue of salvation. There's no other avenue of any provision from the Lord. Are we still good? Paul says this in the end of verse 4, though. We, we, we can't run away from this because your Christianity is more than about you. The people you work with, the people you go to school with, young people, the people in your family, they need to see Christ through you. They need to hear the truth through you. They need to see the truth being lived through you. 
Forget what they think about you. Jesus had to become weak and just accept the will of his Father for his life, and through weakness, no matter what they thought, they thought he was defeated when he was the one who was the victor. Sometimes we get to the point, well, this cross, man, it ain't really working. And I think most of the time the people say that, it's because they're beat down and everybody's thinking negative about them and they're missing the whole point of the cross. The cross looked like it wasn't working, but that's all that was working. Nothing else works. Not in the eyes of God, not with the touch of God upon it told them in Dublin, Georgia last Sunday, you can go over there and stand by that tree and shake for 30 minutes. And it might be a move of God. I, but you can't prove to me that it's a move of God. Quiet up in here. There's no, I mean, somebody lost can go over and shake all over. Beside, you can't prove. I'm not saying it's not a move of God, but you have no proof that it is. The proof you're in a move of God is that the character of Christ, the expression of Christ, your obedience to God's word. It ain't just about you talking about the cross. It's about you carrying it. <sighs> Do we just need to go to lunch now? Y'all sick of this? I hadn't been preaching it but 14 years. I got another man. I hope another 14 it never gets old because it's the only thing that brings newness to my life. It's the only thing that brings power and provision, grace, mercy, peace, knowledge, wisdom. It don't come from no other place. It don't just come from God. It comes from God through a blood-stained son. Nothing else is coming from God. You can forget it. You can lay there and cry and beg God till you're blue in the face. I'm not being ugly this morning. I'm trying to help you. I want you to be more determined to know nothing other than Christ and him crucified than ever before. I want you to begin to depend on him, and when you do, you'll know it because you'll find the grace of God at work in your life, and that means he'll be, he, listen, he will, empower you to be obedient. The excuses are out the window now. We don't live by what we see. We live by faith. Well, it looks like I can't do this and I can't do that. God's word says I will. Hmm. Now, let me tell you something. Now, you've heard me say it through the years. God ain't listening to your lips. He's listening to your heart. For from the heart we speak to God. Amen. And remember, obedience is better than sacrifice. So let's look at this, if y'all will let me. For we also were weak in him. We also were weak in him. I read that and I was like, hold up, that can't be right. That's a misprint because I'm strong in him. No, I'm weak in him. Because in him is referring to Calvary. Which again, I'll repeat it. That's the confirmation that if we're walking in him, that means we're, we're carrying the cross. That means don't picture yourself carrying a wooden beam. That means your faith is in what he provided for you at Calvary. That means forgiveness of all sin, and that means a progressive deliverance from anything that's in your life that's hindering the expression of Christ. Thank you. We also are weak in him, but we shall live, here it comes, with him by the power of God towards you. Remember Romans 8 and 32. Can we put that on the board? It's not in my notes. Romans 8, 32. One, I think it used to be, maybe still is, Robin's favorite scripture for years, and it is a great one. He that spared not his own son, talking about God, but instead of sparing him, keeping him for himself, he delivered him up for how many people? All. He delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely, also freely, give us all things. Notice the words with him. 
with him means your faith is in what he did at Calvary. You're weak in him. Look at what Paul wrote. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God. Remember, when, I, when, I'm look, when I'm feeling weak, when I'm looking weak, when, when it, I just feel like a nobody, guess what? I know the one angel sang about the somebody who still gives strength, who still opens blinded eyes, who still can empty out a cemetery. Amen. He's my strength. Jesus is my strength. Listen, that ain't just a good Bible verse. God is my strength on a good day. I feel like quoting that. God, you're my strength. Hallelujah. Everything's going good in the family. Everything's going good on the job. I'm feeling healthy today. Glory to God, you're my strength. What about when tomorrow comes and you feel like something somebody rubbed on the wall with old greasy finger and everybody's against you at work? And you found yourself even joining in all the mumbo-jumbo, the griping, the arguing, and complaining. Well, he hadn't changed. I'm feeling weak, God. I'm feeling weak. They're making me feel bad. They're making me feel like I'm nothing. They're making me feel like what I believe ain't working. Well, he's going to say to you, look at the cross. It didn't look like it was working, but that's all I'm working in. Never forget that. On your weakest day, you can find the strong hand of God in your life. And the Bible doesn't say he just gives you strength. He says he makes his strength perfect in your weakness. You know when you're experiencing that. The perfect strength of God? The perfect strength of God in your weakness? You know when you're experiencing that. I begin to experience that some 14, 15 years ago in a warehouse here in Atlanta when I was all without hope. I was just frustrated and miserable and didn't know what to do, didn't really know a, a, a lot of what I even believed anymore. And I began to hear the gospel, the message of the cross, and hope began to come alive again. I began to have a desire for ministry again. But I was sure looking and feeling mighty weak, pitiful. The cross looks pitiful. The cross looks like there's no way that can be the answer. That's why we're crucified to the world and they're crucified to us. Because it cannot be the answer. It has no appearance of victory. But the life is in the blood. You're, you should be looking for the life of Christ in every situation and God says it's in the blood. Your physical life is in your blood. The spiritual life you're going to only experience through faith in the blood shed for you of Christ. There is no other place to experience life. Now before we run off from this fourth verse, I want you to see it at the very end. We shall live with him by the power of God towards you. I do care about what you think about how I live. Well, I don't care what they think. Now, there's a balance in that. I don't care what they think who are bashing me and dogging me and saying negative things about me, but at the same time, I do care about what those same people see in me and through me. Don't ever get out there on no hip, hypocritic limb. Well, I don't care what they say. I don't care what they think. I, you better. I don't care what they say about certain things, and I don't care what they think about certain things, or do. But my job, my mission as a Christian is, to, is right here, to live with Christ by the power of God toward them. Not to retaliate and do evil to them who's done evil to me because they were doing evil to Christ, but he was doing good to the whole world. The cross is the greatest picture of God not doing evil to evil, but giving good to evil. The cross is where you look to see it. The cross is where you look to see the fullest picture of grace, love, mercy, everything. If you can't see it, you don't know what I'm talking about, then you don't know who Christ is. There are many Jesuses. 
Many Jesuses. Some people got a Jesus that'll let them live in sin and live in disobedience, let them just do anything they want. That's their Jesus. My Jesus turns to me and says, I rebuke you, Satan. My Jesus says, come out from among them. My Jesus tells me, if I love him, I will be obeying him, or I do not love him. That's, my, that's your Jesus. I hope it's your Jesus. But the church, it, the church has many Jesuses. The church has many Jesuses because the church is full of many spirits and many different gospels. That's not the gospel. Some of y'all get excited when I start talking about that kind of stuff. You ought to be more excited when I'm talking about the cross. Let me tell you again this morning, the cross ain't just for you to bloat in everything that's wrong. The cross is for you to be changed by it so that you can live what is right. Because your life expresses more than your words. Our Christianity is about others seeing Christ through us. Remember, Christians are living with him. If we find our faith in the cross and the experience of being weak in him. You understand that? Let me say it again. The Christian experience biblically is to live with him by the power of God toward others, but that can't happen unless we are weak in him, and that happens through faith in the cross. Look at Galatians 2.20, Brother Noah. You're doing a good job back there. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I. Everybody say, yet not I. Yet not I. You see that? Oh, it's more than me. It's more than me. I'm alive now. I live. Yet it's not me. Who is it? It's Christ living in me. Christ is living in you. Christ is living in you if you're born again. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And you know what I say about this scripture? Yes, we have to have faith, but that ain't what the Bible says here. You have to have faith in Christ, but the Bible means what it says right here. We live by the faith he manifested at Calvary. Amen. The grace he tasted by... Do you hear me? The, 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 the death he tasted by grace, here it comes, through faith. His faith is what got you the grace of God. It's what Jesus did at Calvary that offers God's salvation to you in that alone. And it took, remember, he's the perfect man. And he did the perfect work. And he did it by grace through faith. And that's the faith we live by. Yes, by our faith in what he did by faith at Calvary. This is about Christ now living in us as it is his power, not ours. It's his power, it's not ours. We experience it, it's his power. It's in these earthen vessels, but it's his power. It's his power. The charismatic and a lot of the Pentecostal movement today, which by the way, we are Pentecostal, but they think that now... We are the power. We control the power. No, the power still is in the hands of Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews 1 and 3 that right now he is upholding all things 
by the word of his power. Amen. We good? Now watch this. Another scripture I want to give you this morning. Having a Bible study. Preaching slash teaching slash warning. Amen. Amen. Preaching, warning, teaching. Ain't that like the Apostle Paul? <laughs> Look at Romans 5, 6. For when we were without, yet without strength, here's the avenue through which this power and this strength comes. How'd we get, how'd we, we were without strength, how did we get strength? In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You see, strength is tied to Calvary. There is no strength from God outside of Calvary. We were without strength. What's that mean? That doesn't mean that you weren't a man that couldn't pick up two 500-pound hogs and put them back over the fence. No, that ain't what that means. That means you were without strength in and of yourself. You couldn't save yourself. You couldn't build anything high enough to get to heaven. You couldn't have more gold and silver to buy your way in. You had no strength in the eyes of God. You had no, I had no strength in the eyes of God and I couldn't be strengthened except I believe in Christ and what he did at the cross through weakness by God's strength being made perfect. Y'all going to eat good today for lunch, ain't you? You getting a good appetite worked up in here this morning. I'm telling you, you want to learn about grace, you want to learn about mercy, look in the word through the cross. Man, God will open the scriptures up to you. The light will be so bright. You will be praising God like you never have. You will be in prayer more than you ever have. You're not going to pray yourself into a move of God. You're going to believe yourself into a move of God. You're not going to give enough to, into a move of God. You're going to believe yourself into a move of God or hear me this morning, you ain't going to have one. And every one of us in this room today need a move of God. And I ain't talking about on Wednesday and Sunday. I'm talking about every day I need God stirring and moving and changing. And he can't do it unless I let him. I know there's people out there that preach something different, but they don't know the Bible. They know what it says, but they don't know what it means. When we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You can tie those two words together, without strength, two words, and then ungodly. The ungodly have no strength. The Christians who are living ungodly have access to strength, but they don't have it. They're not apt, they're not applying, they're not benefiting from what they have. Because the strength only comes through my faith in the cross. And I'm glad you how do you explain it? I already have. You can't separate God's strength from God's grace, from the power of Christ. Those are all three the same thing. God's grace is the power of God. God's grace is God's strength made perfect in your weakness. You can't separate. You can't get up and preach on the power of Christ and then the grace of, of God and then the strength of God and have three different messages you can, but they all better have a common denominator, be the blood of Jesus, the cross, the death, the sacrifice, the redemptive, the reconciliation of God through Christ. They all mean, you can't separate them. They're all the same thing. That's why Paul, when God told him, he said, look, my grace is sufficient for you because, here's why my grace is sufficient for you, Beth, because my strength is, it's more than your strength. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. You know what Paul said? Let me read it to you. I got it here. Somewhere. Here it is. He said, this is how you know you get it. This is when you know you get it right here. You may be hearing it, my friend, but this is when you know you get it. Paul said after being told that, most gladly, hey, 
Well, God, I, I guess I'll have to accept it. If I say it is, I, the storm's killing me. I don't so know, God. Most godly! Therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities. Not about them. I don't like this. I ain't glorying about this, I got, but I'm glorying right here in it because your strength is being made perfect in this what seems to be making me weak. You know you got it when that most gladly comes. You, I, I remember in that old warehouse when my lip was hanging out for a while while I was hearing the message of the cross, but one day it clicked and glory to God most gladly. Thank you for this old job up in this warehouse. Thank you for taking everything I had. Thank you for putting me in my mom-in-law's house. Thank you right here in this mess. I'm going to glory. When you get it, that most gladly comes. I see that I'm pitiful looking. I see that everybody in the community thinks I'm a dweeb, but most gladly right here while I'm in this. I'm on glory right here in my infirmities. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul equated the power of Christ with the grace of God with God's grace being made perfect in his weakness. Right there in 2 Corinthians 12. All three of those things right there together. You can't separate it. If, if your faith is in the sacrifice of Christ, and what I mean by that, that's what you're trusting in. That work provided you there. You're, you're identified with that. You're not just interested a little bit in that. You're identified with that. I need to say that again. It's good that you're interested in the cross. But when you become identified with that by faith, oh, that's a whole different ball game. You understand? Amen. God's grace is sufficient for you and me. That's because right in our weakness, I don't mean in our sin, blatant, unrepented of, refusal to change sin. God's grace does not cover your sin. It forgives you and delivers you from it. Church don't know nothing about that either church don't know nothing about that they'll just keep confessing excuses why god thank you for your grace I, I, gr grace don't cover your sin grace saves you from your sin so you can now express christ what would it have been like if i'd have, uh said okay lord i'll let you work in me i'll let you work through me but i'm still gonna deal drugs <laughs> My building wouldn't have, that I used to work in back in the 90s wouldn't have radically been changed if that had been the case. Folks would have just stepped out of uh, their sin in, in uh, dealing with a lot of uh, situations right over into a big boat of religious sin. Are you willing to let God change your life? Because if you are, it's going to affect other people in your life. When God began to change me, boom. She's like, ah! Oh, it was good stuff happening. But sometimes for her, it got a little too good. If God's changing you, honey, it's going to affect people that know you. If, it, if they're not being affected, you ain't changing. When you come out of a life of drugs, that changes other people. Amen. When you come home from work and say, we can't live here like this no more. This got to change. That's going to affect other people. When you've been stealing on your job and you say, I ain't doing that no more. That's going to affect other people. When you stop showing up at them parties, they're going to call you, where you at? Oh, boy. You know you the life of the party. It's going to affect them. 
When you ain't buying and dealing and selling, when you ain't showing up, that affects other people. When you stop using foul language, that affects other people. When you stop telling the jokes that you used to tell, what's wrong with him? That affects other people. Are you having an effect on other people by the power of Christ? If you're being changed, you are. I'm telling you, Christianity is radical. The church has milked it down to make it where it ain't nothing but just another kosher, get along with everybody religion. Christianity ain't that. The cross wasn't that. Y'all about to make me preach myself happy up in here this morning. We, I don't have a religion. I don't have one of the few things that works. I got the only thing that works. Amen, Fredine. You shouting back there this morning, glory to God. <laughs> you letting Dale out do you this morning. <laughs> Gladys going to get up and run here in a minute. <laughs> do you know what you've got? You've got the ability by the power of the Holy Spirit because of what Christ did at Calvary, not just to be changed one time, but to be being changed every day. It's the most miraculous thing on the planet outside of that first initial change, salvation. I mean, look at me and Virgil. We're from decap. Come on. I think about him all the time. Me and Virgil's son. We from the same little old podunk town. Let me tell you something. This message ain't up there in that town. It, well, it may be. I don't know. I hope it is. But the, the past we used to have, and now we over here worshiping God together, I know he would have never thought that about me. But God can change anybody. He can save anybody. From anything, anytime. Some of y'all up in here need some saving today. I'm just being the daddy to you, right? Some of you need some saving. I ain't talking about from going to hell. Well, maybe that too. Some of you need some saving from yourself. Got to have it your way. Got to be the boss. Mm -hmm. We better quit. The Lord has blessed us. Amen, Sister Noah. The Lord has blessed us. We're not better than anybody on the planet, but we are being equipped. We are being equipped for the work of the ministry. And we are, if we're believing the truth, being changed. We have more than a testimony of where we go to church and who our preacher is. Our testimony is that that appears through our lives. If it's not, then even though you're telling folk the right stuff, they ain't listening to you. Hear me now. They're not even following you on Facebook. You just think they are. They, had, they hadn't unfriended you. They hadn't blocked you, but they just not fought. They're not even seeing your stuff because they're too nice to block you, unfriend you. They just don't follow you no more because your life ain't what you're trying to tell others. I'm not talking about perfection, but let me tell you something about the lost world. They see and recognize what's real. They, the lost world, recognizes who's real. Who are they? Those who are being changed. Not just going, well, I go to church. No, those who are being changed. And in today's church, if you're being changed, eventually... If you're in the wrong church, they're going to probably tell you, 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 you might need, this might not be the church for you. That's happening every Sunday. Somebody in one of these certain churches, they go to weeping and crying. What's wrong with them, I wonder? Well, if you start crying in here, we're just going to pray for you. God's touching your heart. 
you start crying in some in churches, they're going to gather up and say, well, they got problems. We, I guess we need to uh, see if this is the right church for her. You lift your hands once, that'll get their attention. You lift your hands twice, they're going to talk to you. You lift your hands that third time, they're going to say, well, this probably ain't the right church for you. Can I tell you this morning, you can cry up in here. You can laugh up in here. You can lift your hands up in here. You can clap in here. You can run in here. You can shout in here. See, a lot of these churches, like these biker churches, these cowboy churches, they still Baptist folk. They know there's more. They just got them another building and got them another name, but they still right where they were. They just clap now and every once in a while raise that, but they still ain't preaching this message. And they still don't believe in the baptism with the Holy Spirit. The ones I know, I'll have to add that. But I know what we believe. And because of what we're believing, we're being changed. I said we're being changed. You ain't being changed because you say you are. You're being changed when the fruit's there and others, it's toward others. The change is not just for you. Paul said, we live now with him by the power of God toward others. Amen? Stand with me this morning. Praise the Lord.